Good morning from Stanford University. My name is Will Chu. I am a professor of material science engineering and the co-director of Storage X Initiative at the Precord Institute for Energy. I am uh, happy to be joined by the Precord Energy Director Yi Tsui today to have our bi-weekly Storage X seminar. Today, we are extremely happy to have two outstanding academic colleagues join us to talk about advanced electrolyte and aqueous chemistry for next generation batteries. This is an exceptional important topic and we are very happy to be hearing from the two of the world's experts. Our speakers today are Professor uh, Chen Sheng Wang and Professor Yi Jun Lu. Uh, Professor Wang is from the University of Maryland and Professor Lu is from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And I'm pleased to introduce Professor Wang in a little bit more detail. He is currently the Robert Franklin and Francis Ricks Wright Chair in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Maryland. He directs the Center for Research in Extreme Battery, and he's very well known for his outstanding work in aqueous batteries, advanced electrolytes such as water and salt electrolyte, and he has been recognized as a highly cited researcher since 2018. He has made many important contributions today and has many uh, students and postdocs who are now working as independent scientists contributing to the battery and electrochemi electrochemistry community worldwide. Chen we are so pleased to have you today and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you for the invitation. And I really appreciate the opportunity and I will start to share my screen. Today I will talk about electrolytic design for high capacity battery, lithium ion battery. First, I want to mention what is the current electrolytic and for the lithium ion battery. So this is, is the uh, Electrode potential reference for lithium uh, metal. Aqueous electrolytes, and normally have a 2.0 volt uh, because they cannot further extend one potential lower than 2.5 reference to the lithium, and they will generate hydrogen. And above 4.5, they will generate the oxygen. And so they cannot form, uh, the, air, the water cannot form a solid phase passive to the, the electrode. So that's the limited the window. And so then because of the narrow window limited the energy density, so then they switch to the organic, the solvent. Use the organic solvent to replace the water, the advantages organic solvent when they reduce, they form a polymer. So when the potential lower and also the salt has opportunity to also reduce, they form SEI. So in traditional ECDMC electrolytes, all the lithium is solved by the, the solvent and PF6, uh, they also associate, but loosely associate with the lithium. When the lithium move to the anode side, the bring solvent and PF6 close to the anode. And then they reduce both the solvent and the PF6 reduce, and they form organic, inorganic SEA passive on the anode surface. If it is graphite, and then the organic, inorganic, the SEA strongly bonded with the graphite make the Columbic efficiency really high, 99.98. That ensure graphite can achieve one solvent cycle. Because organic inorganic SEA is flexible, strongly bounded with graphite, 
can tolerate 12% volume change of Wi-Fi. So that makes the lead mine battery so successful. But if we want to increase the capacity and uh, use silicon or lithium to replace the Wi-Fi, then we, if we use the same electrolysis, they also form the same SEA. But since the, this SEA organic, yeah, organic also strongly bonded with the liquid metal, and the liquid metal during plating, stripping, they have a huge volume change. And if the bonding really strong, the SEA also suffer similar volume change, and then during many, many repeat volume change, they will crack. When they crack, they have a self-heal and reduce the quality efficiency to 95. So that will limit the, the, the cycle life. So the goal is how can we change the electrolysis, make this number is high, uh, at least 99.9 above. Then what kind of SEA can tolerate lithium? So we believe this bonding should be weak. If they are weak, then if lithium diffuse, I diffuse through the SEA and become the lithium atom, then the bonding weak, they can easily diffuse along the interface. Second, if the bonding weak, meaning interface energy is high, if lithium have by chance, they penetrate into the SEA, they will have a high, large, very large energy penalty because the interface energy is high. Any additional increase in the interface that will bring additional large energy uh, required. So in this case, we think we need for uh, SEA with, which has a very high interface energy with a big metal. By calculation, we find out that lithium chloride has the highest interface energy with a big metal. So this is the calculated result. We consider all the ceramic and we find out that lithium chloride has the highest interface energy. The also mechanical uh, shear module is high. If we multiply these two numbers, they are highest. Normally polymer normally has very uh, high, strong bonding with the lithium. And so in that case, we prefer ceramic. Uh, in all ceramic, we prefer lithium chloride. And second, lithium chloride also has a really largest band gap. The meaning is electronic conductivity is the lowest. And if electronic conductivity is the lowest, uh, when they form SCA at a very thin the, the thickness, they will block electronics. Very thin SCA translate into a very high first cycle quantity efficiency. Third is if by chance we can form lithium fluid on the cathode side, and then you see the stability window lithium fluid is highest compared to others. So in this talk, we are all, we will not only mention the lithium fluid on the lithium metal, we also talk if we form a lithium fluid on the high capacity cathode like the MC811, they also significantly increase the cycle life. So in this, based on the, the, this justification, we think the best way is to form a lithium fluid. But how can we form a lithium fluid? So the idea is we need to reduce the anion rather than solvent because anion reduce the form lithium fluoride as if they are fully naked, the ion. If we want to reduce the ion, uh, the preferred uh, largely reduce the ion, we should bring more ion concentration. Also, we want solvent that has a lower reduction potential, whereas ion has a high reduction potential. So they have a very large uh, reduction potential gap. So first we talk about how can we increase fluorinated ion concentration. So one is we put a, a lot of a salt, and uh, either F, uh, PF6 or FSA. And if we put a lot of a salt there and they can form CAP and AGG, meaning when lithium move to the anode side to bring more ion. 
So anion has more opportunity to reduce, so they can form a little fluoride. So this is a, the, the PNL also do a lot of work and we use the carbonate, we put a lot of salt there and they really can increase it, the efficiency 99.2. But uh, when we put a lot of salt there, <clears throat> viscosity is high. And then we think we can uh, reduce the viscosity by use the dilute. And also PNL did a lot of work and called this as a localized high, high concentrated electrolytes. We did the same thing. We use the HFE diluted the high concentrated electrolytes. Different is we use carbonate because carbonate has a higher reduction potential and they also has a chance to be reduced. And then we use a fluorinated carbonate. So even the solvent reduced, they still have opportunity to form a different fluoride. So we can give, get the same polymeric efficiency as high concentrated, but the 99.2 is still too low. And then we think second method is increase the gap and we add ether because ether has a very lower reduction potential like a PHF. PHF reduced at the 0.2.3, but a PF6 at the 1.2 and uh, 1 volt. So they have a huge gap here. And then in this case, and we can have a high chance to reduce the PF6. Second, also in the PF6 mixed THF, we have a lot of CIP, also a lot of uh, AGG here, but uh, the SSAP very small. So that means not only the concentration, the reduction potential gap increase, also the, the, the concentration ion also high. And so in that case, we use these electrolytes, we can reach uh, high Olympic efficiency 99.8. In addition, to reach this high Olympic efficiency, we also put a lithium phyllic substrate. This is graphite and bismuth. We mix it together. This allows lithium uh, nucleation uniformly. So here, lithium phyllic, uh, here, uh, lithium phobic. Then the lithium metal can uniform distribute and bonded with substrate also block lithium form dendrite. So that's two reasons make this the high, really high polymeric efficiency. And this is not only for lithium metal, any the anode with high the volume change, they also work at the same principle. And then we try micro size silicon. Silicon normally micro size, everybody believe it's a really, really challenge. But we use this design, we validate, we use micro silicon, we can reach 99.9. .9. So micro size, we talk about is more than 10 micron, uh, even 20. And for the silicon, we know when micro size silicon, they have a crack. Right now, traditional SEA, if they SEA, silicon crack, SEA also crack electrolytic penetrate, and then they form SEA separate the crack of silicon. If you have a lithium fluoride and the bond is so weak, and if even inside the silicon crack, if SEA can protect it, electrolytic cannot penetrate, then they still can contact each other, so it's still working. The same thing, and right now, everybody want to use a high capacity cathode, NMC811, Whenever you have a high capacity, then we have a crack. Same principle hold also right if you form lithium fluoride SEA. And even inside the crack, the electrolyte cannot penetrate. They still can achieve very stable cycle life. So we'll show some data. And right now, since we have a, still have a solvent, even we use THF. And, but it still have an opportunity to reduce because reduction potential is still higher than the, the initiation of a silicon potential. If we want totally a, a, avoid our problem, another way is to use a solvent-free ionic liquid. So we, demo, we synthesize some ionic liquid and we demonstrate on the little metal anode, we make 99.9, .9, even at the high 
error capacity to 5 meter an hour per center square. So from this, we think if solvent is really, uh, um, it's not good for the high capacity, the electro, because the volume potential is really big. And another way is totally get rid of a solvent is solid state electrolyte. Solid state, we can consider no solvent. It should be perfect. But when we use our zero and they bring additional challenge, they have an electronic conductivity there. And second, because in the liquid, they never have a, this issue. They, are, they do not have any electronic conductivity in the liquid electrolytes. Second issue is in the liquid electrolyte, we can easily adjust the composition from the liquid fry, but our zero, you never form a liquid fry. So that two challenges make the Olympic efficiency even lower than liquid. And for the sulfide, we have one opportunity is we, found we, we can put a chlorine in the electrolyte and then they form a lithium chloride. In the liquid electrolyte, lithium chloride will dissolve into the electrolyte, but in the solid, they not. So this, the, the sulfide, if we add chlorine, up to now is better than LPS. The reason is the interface energy lithium chloride is higher compared to traditional chloride free LPS solid electrolytes. But the still efficiency is still not high. The reason is the reduction, this is really not uh, stable. And the reduction is compared to zero. they are most less stable. So that's make this lithium chloride concentration is slow, is small. So if we can add additional more chloride here, if we really form the passivated lithium chloride, maybe we have a chance to increase the Columbic efficiency. So today I will give one example, talk about this and how the lithium chloride improve the cycle life of micro -sizing. So this is a, the principle also suitable for aqueous because aqueous, the limitation is water, also the solvent. If you can avoid the solvent reduction, use the, the knowledge we develop, maybe we can also extend the aqueous electrolytes window. So now we think, we think the aqueous value. Aqueous, the solvent, same as the organic, the lithium solvent with the water. So they're limited uh, the window. If we put a lot of salt, is that the same as uh, in organic? We really can extend the window because the salt has the opportunity to reduce and then form SCN. And another unique is if we put a lot of salt in the water and they are separated with some uh, high order polysulfide or <clears throat> some really uh, hydrophilic salt, the solution, then they bring us a new opportunity for new type of the battery. For example, sulfur. Sulfur in organic, the high order polysulfide dissolved, but in the water in salt, and they are phase separated because this lithium sulfide also hydrophilic and the electrolytes, lithium TFSI 21 molar, also lithium philic. Uh, they, they are really both attract the water, but they are phase separate. Then we have an opportunity to charge discharge uh, in a liquid reaction and without a shuttle. Also, we can use the lithium chloride, the lithium bromide, and use the chlorine and bromide into insert into the graphite because they are phase separation and bromide chloride cannot diffuse back. So this is a new opportunity. But right now, we, are, we further use this chemistry in the organic. And we demonstrate that this chemistry also can work in the, uh, the organic. But uh, we get this knowledge by, by the water in salt chemistry. But uh, this high concentration electrolyte, they have a, definitely have a, some uh, challenge is uh, the cost. So we have to reduce the cost. Reduce the cost of the medium, reduce the concentration of the salt. 
If we reduce the concentration of salt, uh, then we cannot form SCI. If we not form SCI, they cannot extend the window. So we have to add additional salt to form SCI. And then we use ammonia OTF. And then we put the, the, the salt as uh, OTF as a salt. We take an example of zinc. We use zinc OTF and put ammonia OTF. Ammonia, the cation large size, and they absorb on the zinc surface. And then why is they can block the water second, they have opportunity to reduce. So they can form a zinc fluoride, SEI. Is that the same as a little metal battery? If you have a zinc fluoride, and they have a high interface energy, a zinc is not easily penetrated from dendrite. So we can get a really high plumbic efficiency. We will show some data. And the same principle. And we check all the ceramic and the, the zinc fluoride, I think the carbonate has highest interface energy. And then we develop on purpose, develop a zinc, the, the carbonate uh, zinc fluoride SEI um, cover on the surface. This is in situ form. And also, uh, uniquely, if you put uh, the OTF, OTF is hydrophobic. When you increase the cathode potential and OTF absorb on the surface, it block the water. And then we find out if water not involved into the cathode oxygen reaction, they really have a two electron reaction that will be really fast. So this is one way we, we, we use this aqueous battery the knowledge and develop a zinc air battery. Second is we also use add non-flammable solvent into the water in salt. Then in that case, we can reduce the salt concentration. So recently we add non-flammable solvent. We turn the window, the, the cathodic reduction potential to 1.2 volt, and we demonstrate that MMO, LTO, uh, we can have a, a 2.5 million hour percent square high loading steel cycle really stable. So this is the date we put a power cell and we can cycle 200. So today I will take this as an example, show the chemistry, show the principle, how the interfacial energy and can prevent the dendrite of zinc. So this is the first talk about the, the lithium uh, ion battery we use silicon. So silicon anode, we see micro size, they crack, silicon crack, also the SEI crack. And the reason we just mentioned because they strongly bonded with the SEI strongly bonded with silicon, silicon crack, SEI definitely will crack. So we have to, if crack SEI electrolyte penetrated, then they are separated the silicon. In this case, the, the, the silicon separate each other and then we lost the capacity. Another way is to go to nano size. I think E3 did so much work and successfully demonstrate this nano silicon is the, the, the best choice. But the silicon, nano silicon also suffer first cycle Columbic efficiency and the calendar, calendar life may be also a challenge. Same principle, MC811, if high capacity, they really have a crack. And if you really use the same electrolytes, they have the same problem. If the organic, inorganic SEI bounded, if crack inside it, crack, the SEI may be also crack. Also organic component in the, in the CI will be uh, dissolved at high potential. So we really also prefer lithium fluoride. So the, our idea design is, this is active material, what I was silicon of MC811. If we can form lithium fluoride, they have a high interface energy, bond is so weak. When the volume change, they shrink and expand it because the bonding is so weak, the, SCI, the CI or SCI, they are stable, lithium fluoride is stable. So we hope in this case, if this is stable, the electrolyte cannot penetrate. So even they crack, they still contact and then they're still working. 
So this is we assume if we have a SEI, if fraud SEI, CI on the surface, even inside the crack, it should keep a stable type of light. And then we demonstrate. First, we talk about silicon. Silicon, we calculate all listed silicon at a different the, the level. We calculate interface energy with the uh, lithium fluoride. They have a high interface energy. Second, we try to form high concentration of lithium fluoride in the SCI. So they depend on the concentration of the ion, also the potential difference between the ion, reduction potential for ion and solvent. So this is where we demonstrate traditional electrolytics. We have, they have a lot of SSIP, and, but in the, the TIPF, lithium TF6, we have a lot of CIP. In that case, we can prefer reduce the TF6. And so in that case, you see here, we have a very small SSIP. And in the traditional electrolyte, we, they only have a small CIP, but we have a huge amount of CIP in the mixed THF. And AGG also high, here AGG very small traditional electrolyte. Also the potential we just demonstrated. Traditional electrolytes, the solvent and the ion reduction potential similar at one point, uh, one volt, but in the THF, THF reduces potential very lower and the ion reduction potential very high. And then we think the mechanism is, this is a charge discharge curve for silicon. And this is the stress they measure the use the, the thin film of silicon. The concept is when the lithiation uh, during the volume change, you say at the beginning of the elastic deformation, but after a certain lithiation level, and then it becomes plastic. So meaning they have a like a lithium at a high concentration, they are really soft. So if we can block the SCI, uh, block the silicon during the, the elastic deformation, if the electrolyte cannot penetrate it, later, even the crack, they can self healed because they are really slow. So then we think the opportunity is if we have a silicon and when we decrease the potential meanings, initiation, and at the beginning, when they reach to the potential lower than TF6, they form a little fry. And even to here, the volume change is very small because the, the lithiation amount is very small. And also they have a, they start the volume change when you have a lithiation. We know at here, the fully elastic deformation, they may have a crack, but if the bonding is so weak and even they crack and the, as the, the lithium fluoride can survive, and then the electrolytes cannot penetrate. After that, they have a plastic uh, deformation and then they maybe they can hold and seal, heal the, the, the crack. And because I hear the solvent not reduced, the, the polymer not formed, the only form that is a lithium fluoride. Only at the very end, and when with the potential ratio to lower lithium uh, THF reduction potential, then they can start. But normally we already form a lithium fluoride. So theoretically so it's 0.3 reduced potential. But if we have a lithium fluoride there, they should have a over potential. This is only formed at the end of this age. So when we come back, and because the bonding is so weak, and then the lithium, the silicon will shrink, they can easily untouch the, the lithium fluoride. So the SCI is stable. And then second cycle, they are just continue the cycle. So we demonstrate this concept. This is a, the this is a silicon. And then we check this really have a lithium fluoride or not. We use the beam. Here, we use the beam uh, to check the surface. This is we just snapshot. And we want, because the beam damage of lithium fluoride is really serious. So at the beginning, you see, so you cannot see clearly, we believe it's the polymer and the lithium fluoride. If we use the beam, a, a little bit longer time, we will see inside, you see the silicon like flow. More clearly, we just put this side at the beginning, at the beginning, just put a continue uh, the beam damage to the surface. We will see gradually, you see gradually and gradually clear, meaning we decompose the polymer surface. 
and the lithium fluoride, we really can see inside the silicon flow. So this is after many cycle, you will see the silicon at the beginning particle right now is like a fiber because they have a crack, but they are not separated by the electrolysis as yet. And then we check the surface is really has as lithium fluoride or not. This is silicon particle. And then we use the yields to mapping the lithium fluoride. We really see the, the lithium fluoride covered on the surface. And then we use the yields to identify and we check this is a, the, the, the one, two, three, four, five, and then we use the yields of the mapping. We say at the surface is the polymer, and in the second layer nearby surface, we have a lithium fluoride, and inside is lithium, lithium silicon. So we really see clearly see the lithium fluoride. And if you trace, use traditional electrolytes, you never see the clear lithium fluoride surface, the layer they always mix with the carbon, the polymer. So this identify, we really form lithium fluoride on the surface use HHF solvent. So this is the, the cross-section of the silicon electrode. So we just bought the silicon from sigma, sigma outreach and 325 mesh. We did not do any treatment and we just put the electrolysis and cycle. So this is a, a THF electrolysis, different cycles. They are really stable. But you should traditional electrolyte, different cycle, quickly decay. And we also show high rate because lithium fluoride always believe has a very lower uh, lithium conductivity and maybe they have a suffer from grid capability. But uh, I need to mention is lithium fluoride is so thin overall with the ESR really, really small. So they are even increased the read capability. So this is the read performance. We can reach to the, the 3C and 5C. So 5C we still got a, the high capacity, but the red one is traditional electrolyte. They quickly decay. And very impressive cycle life, micro size silicon. They can really stable and traditional electrolyte is 20 cycle, they quickly decay. So lithium fluoride, not only for silicon, because lithium fluoride normally has a very high interface energy to all the other chemical, because they are bound so strong, they cannot bond to the other uh, element. So we demonstrated it's a universal design principle to we test the aluminum, 20 micron. And we charge the charge at a different read, read capacity, and cycle life. So this is a 250 cycle, and they are also stable. Micro size, first polymer versus 91 similar as graphite. And not only uh, aluminum, bismuth, same thing, 30 micro, and without any treatment. And we just charge, recharge. This is charge, recharge curve, read the performance because this is electronic conductor. So read even high, the C read even high, cycle line. So this we demonstrate, this is a universal design. And then we check the full cell. THF, the problem is the anotic stability is, is lower because it is easier. We want to reduce the reduction potential, also we sacrifice oxidation potential also lower. So we first try the lithium ion phosphate. So we use the uh, uh, LFP silicon match with bismuth and alumina. All of three, they make the full cycle cycle really stable. So the NPN ratio only 1.3. Traditional electrolyte for silicon full cycle quickly decay. And we also demonstrate MC, NCA, but NCA we cannot charge to the above 4.1 because that is the limitation of the THF. So right now we develop a generally two electrolytes. So now we can um, cycle NMC811 to save. So we, we demonstrate, we say this is universal, not only for NO, any high capacity electrolyte, this should be suitable. And then we check the cattle. 
Lithium cobalt side, if we increase the, the charge potential to 4.5, we can get a high capacity, 200. But a traditional electrolyte quickly decay. If we use our high voltage electrolytes, they can form a lithium chloride. They're really much stable than the traditional electrolytes. Columbic efficiency can reach 99.5. So this is generation one, and uh, high voltage electrolytes. So we have a generation two electrolytes. We test in the AMC811, and this is a cyclic. So it's a 500 cycle. Columbic efficiency, 99.99, same as Wi-Fi, really stable. So we show this is a concept, lithium fluoride, but this lithium fluoride should be in situ form, not just uh, pre-artificial, because if they have a damage, they can set here. So that is organic. And then we talk about aqueous. Aqueous, and uh, we take a sample of zinc air. So the, we want to emphasize in the aqueous, if we put the ammonia OTF, they can form an SEI. Also, if we put a hydrophobic OTF, the salt, they can, when the charge, they can block the water in the cathode side. And then water not involved or less involved in the, the, the oxidation reduction reaction that they can go through the two electrons reaction. So this is the, the idea and hydrophobic OTF, when you have a charge they, on the cathode side, they block the water. And then the water not involved reaction and then they can easily form a zinc oxide, uh, zinc uh, uh, peroxide. And this is the reaction we demonstrated there are two electron reaction in a zinc OTF. And during charge discharge, they keep the reversible because two electron reaction much faster than four electronics. So they keep the cycle life really stable and very fast charge. And also when we put ammonia OTF, ammonia can reduce the form of the SEA, the zinc fluoride SEA on the zinc, they can block the uh, zinc dendrite. So they have, a, when we check the SEA on the zinc surface, you have a really high the fluorine and also oxygen. And then we, 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 we think it's that they have a zinc fluoride, zinc carbonate on the zinc surface. And we check, we check the zinc plating stripping and the efficiency is 99.9 above. When you reach this high efficiency, you really can make the uh, zinc anode free cell. So we really make a zinc free uh, cell, power cell, they can cycle 100. I think that is the, the talk. I hope not extend too much <laughs> the time. Thank you and for attending the, my talk. So I turn over to you. Tristan, thank you very much for sharing that uh, comprehensive and systematic body of work. We have a couple of minutes for questions, so let's get started. Um, maybe the first question is from me. Tristan, you talk a lot about Coulombic efficiency, but I believe you also show impedance at the interface, especially at the cathode, is also strongly affected by the electrolyte due to the desolvation barrier and kinetics. Can you talk a little bit about the difference in the design rules for high Coulombic efficiency versus low impedance on the cathode or the anode side in terms of the electrolyte choice? So the, the impedance, so when you have a high interface energy, so we can make the cycle life is better, but they also increase the impedance because the interface the energy high, the bonding weak. But if we form the CA or SEA has a very lower ESR, the meaning resonance, total resonance small, the total impedance is not increased. That we demonstrate, they still have a very high read capability. So the key part is we know the interface energy, interface resonance definitely increase because you, you form the CA, SEA, we on purpose design have a high resistance. So the key part, if you want to 
the, the have a total risk small, you need to reduce the SEA and cell impedance. So that is, we say, lithium fluoride. They are so thin because the electronic conductivity is so low. So I have what the concept I say for the SEA, the criteria should be electron, uh, ionic conductivity divided by electronic conductivity. Even ionic conductivity is lower at lithium fluoride, but they have a very, very lower electronic conductivity. So they reduce the thickness really more significantly than the reduce on the ionic conductivity. So this ratio is still high. This ratio should be linked with the, the ESR. So that is a total error resistance. So that is my point. Tristan, this is very interesting. Maybe a related question is, I, I know there's not a lot of data here, so maybe this is just intuition. For most of the inorganic SCI, I believe the prevailing hypothesis in the community is that the bulk transport in the SCI is limiting, hence the importance of ionic connectivity. But how about the interfacial resistance between the inorganic SCI and the bulk electrolyte, for example? Is that ever, or do you believe that could be limiting in some cases? Yes, this is uh, related to the right now the solid state battery. They say, oh, how about we put an organic electrolysis? And a lot of people argue, and um, when they transfer from organic uh, ion to the ceramic, what is the resistance? They definitely have an additional resistance there. And it's really, I think it depends on the interface. And so the interface between the ceramic and organic electrolysis, and if they have a, some, uh, uh, the lithium ion have a bonding with the ceramic, and then they have a transition period, very thin layer, that will reduce the uh, like a activation energy. Mm -hmm. So now to say you totally block the solvent to go to the ceramic. If you have an interface between them, and the bonding is a transition, I think that it may be not a critical issue. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Um, maybe let me segue into the ionic conductivity. So one thing that has always been you know, very confusing to me is the discrepancy between the bulk ionic conductivity of lithium fluoride and lithium oxide versus the apparent conductivity that we can infer from the rate capability of the batteries is many orders of magnitude different. What do you think the mechanism is that gives higher, uh, gives rise to the higher ionic conductivity in the deposited SCI versus the bulk material? Yeah, I think that the deposit one, maybe they have uh, two possibilities. One is they deposit from solution. They have a liquid. When they form a solid, they have to remove the liquid. Then they have a porosity layer. I don't think they, they are same as in the in the vacuum deposit. They are really dense. Because they have to remove the liquid, maybe they are not form a crystal. Maybe they're more like a amorphous. Mm. So in that case, so that even the form crystal, the green boundary, they have a chance. They are not so dense, but that can easily block the solvent. And but it's not really dense. Mm. So in that case. They can slightly increase the ionic mm -hmm. conductivity. Second, in situ form always thin because they are limited by electronic conductivity. If the bulk is, there are no limitation. You just deposit. They have a certain thickness. The in situ form, the electronic conductivity lower. When they form very very thin, they stop. So overall resistance still very small. Mm -hmm. Maybe we take one last question. Um, this one has to do with the uh, formation uh, protocol. So in your work, uh, Trenton, are you exploring the formation as a way to alter the deposition of the inorganic SCI um, when you're screening the material, or do you typically use a standard formation protocol? We just use standard. Uh, because we think <clears throat> the lithium fluoride that they can form SCA really quickly and that stop. Mm. And so that's easily formed during just a few, maybe five to 10 cycles, they already form. 
and stabilize. Mm. When you have uh, organic inorganic, uh, then you have a vol large volume change. Then it will take a long, long time because the gravity crack, heal, crack, heal, and then they take a long time. And when they reach large thickness, then stable. If really they can fly pure, they can easily just stop, stabilize. So we normally time cycle and we can reach a stable capacity. All right, uh, Tristan, thank you very much. Still many mysteries uh, for SCS as always, uh, but thank you very much for sharing your comprehensive body of work. Uh, so now let me invite uh, E to come and introduce our next speaker, uh, Louis Jin. E? Yeah, thank you, Will. Um, Chun-Sun, very, very nice talk. A very strong dose on electrolyte. I always enjoy your talk about that. Now let me invite uh, Professor Yi Chen Lu to come to the uh, uh, podium. Uh, let me do an introduction about Yi Chen. Um, Yi Chen did his, her undergrad in uh, National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. Then after that, he went to MIT uh, to get her PhD in material science and engineering. So following by a postdoc in Germany, he, she later uh, joining um, Chinese University of Hong Kong as a faculty. She's cu currently associate professor right there. Yi Chun has been doing quite exciting work in the past decade. I have been follow her uh, research quite a bit. Now in her own research group, she has a variety of the battery related project ranging from redox flow, to metal, oxygen, sulfur, uh, selenium battery, solid state, and so on. Uh, her work has been widely recognized. Um, she has won numerous awards, uh, including Young Research Award in 2016, the University Education Award uh, in 2016, as well as Vice Chancellor, Exemplary uh, Teaching Award. She's also a founding member of Young Academy of Science of Hong Kong. Uh, with that, Yichun, I would like to invite you to uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Trey. Um, hello, everyone. So uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Trey and Will's kind invitation to speak. Uh, it's a great honor to speak at the Storage X Symposium. Um, me and my group members has been uh, following closely to every lecture since the inauguration of the symposium. So thank you all very much. So today uh, I'd like to share our recent work in the area of aqueous batteries, including uh, lithium ion batteries and the uh, redox flow battery. So batteries are very important uh, devices in our daily life and uh, uh, we actually uh, need batteries from electric vehicles, smart grid for the green cities, and storing renewable energies, as well as the large scale grid storage. So we are putting big batteries in our house, in our cars. Therefore, safety is one of the most important factors in battery design. Um, so currently, Commercial lithium ion batteries use flammable electrolytes, uh, which will cause uh, battery fires and explosions, uh, ranging from uh, cell phones, laptops, and electric vehicles. And even at a larger scale, when we connect batteries with renewable energy, such as wind power and solar power plants. So these type of catastrophic uh, fire explosions are very serious things that we have to address. Therefore, um, using aqueous electrolyte, in fact, is an effective way to mitigate this type of uh, fire explosion. Uh, however, water is limited by its stability window, and traditional aqueous batteries are limited around 2 volts. Uh, thanks to Professor Wang and Professor Xi's group uh, work uh, proposing a, a new concept of water and salt electrolyte um, using highly concentrated electrolyte to stabilize water 
uh, by reducing free water molecules as well as forming stable SCI layer. Uh, their work has been widely uh, applied and also in their work, they show a working prototype of a full aqueous lithium ion batteries, uh, more than three volts and with very stable uh, cycling stability as well. So water in salt electrolyte has been widely applied and uh, with many subsequent uh, efforts in the field, um, including uh, hydrate melts uh, using about 20 molarity of lithium TFSI um, and or 42 uh, lithium TFSI or 33 molarity uh, LIPTFSI. FSI. So these highly concentrated electrolytes are effective in increasing water stability, um, as we see that they provide wider stability window compared to pure water. Uh, however, they are also facing high cost and potential toxicity um, issues for future uh, application in terms of commercialization and also uh, sustainability. So when we start thinking about this problem, um, we were thinking, how can we avoid using highly concentrated electrolyte but still stabilize water? So we are inspired by a common phenomenon uh, that in living cells uh, called molecular crowding. So molecular crowding essentially states that the activity of water can be significantly modified if we have a large molecule such as proteins um, present with high concentrations in the solution. So changing water activity using large amount of mole molecular crowding agents could change activity. So we were thinking could that be a path to reduce water uh, decomposition using low cost and eco-friendly crowding agents? So the idea is that to use uh, the crowding agents, um, which will interact with water molecules through hydrogen bonding. Uh, and this type of hydrogen bonding is in fact weaker than water-water hydrogen bonding. But because we put a lot of it, now we can reduce water and water uh, hydrogen bonds. And therefore we can actually strengthen the OH covalent bond, which then can discourage water splitting. So in other words, using a crowding agents such as water miscible polymers that we may be able to stabilize water uh, in our aqueous electrolyte. So in order to uh, verify this concept, um, we found a very common crowding agent for water. Uh, this is a, a polyethylene glycol and it's a water miscible polymer, which means that it can be mixed with water in any ratio. And thanks to that, we can make uh, this type of electrolytes in more than 90% of the PEG uh, mixed with water. And PEG is not toxic and it's low cost. And you can see uh, this material has significantly lower in cost compared to the lithium salt. So in the electrolyte that we're going to use are going to have only two molarity for the ion conduction and um, will vary the PEG content to see the uh, stability window of water. So uh, first we conduct the uh, LSV to see the electrochemical voltage window. So as you can see here, the hydrogen evolution onset potential are significantly de delay as we increase the content of PG from 70% all the way to 94%. Um, and with 94% of PEG, we're able to delay the HER to after 1.3 volts of lithium. So with that, we're able to achieve a 3.2 volts window with a low uh, concentration of the salt 
and using the molecular crowding agent uh, to stabilize the water. So we use uh, DFT to understand the water environment in the molecular crowding electrolyte and versus the uh, and versus the uh, electrolyte in the regular electrolyte. So you can see um, the regular aqueous electrolyte, we have a lot of uh, free water um, running around. And with the molecular crowding electrolyte, not only we're we reducing the free water, but also waters are actually bounded uh, with the PEG molecular crowding agents. And therefore, their environments are very different uh, in terms of uh, their, 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 their property and their uh, chemical environment. So to further understand how the crowding agent um, change the environment of water molecules, we use NMR and FTIR to probe uh, as increase the PEG content, how does that change water's environment? So here we can see through NMR, uh, we see that as we increase the PEG content, we found that the water actually become more shielded and which indicates a weaker hydrogen bond network around the water. At the same time, um, FTIR shows that as we increase PG content, the OH stretching has a blue shift uh, through this uh, uh, FTIR spect spectra. And we can see that means that the OH stretching become higher in energy uh, with stronger bonding. So these evidence supports our hypothesis that with crowding agents, we're able to strengthen the uh, OH bond in the water molecules, and therefore discourage the uh, water splitting reaction. So using this electrolyte um, through a 4.5 volt all the way to 1.3 volts, we are able to apply uh, LMO as a positive electrode and LTO as the negative electrode uh, to see a full cell reaction in this electrolyte. So before we cycle the battery, we want to see whether uh, the hydrogen evolution reaction or even oxygen evolution reaction is really uh, suppressed in the full cell. So we apply the online electrochemical mass spectroscopy to online monitoring the gas evolutions of this electro electrolyte in the full cell. So you can see um, this is the first cycle of charge discharge profile. And you can see that there is no sign of the hydrogens or oxygens or other type of parasitic gas evolution. Um, and this is the same even for the 10 cycle. So you can see indeed uh, not only the cyclic photometry shows a stability window, but using uh, mass spectrometry can still uh, show that there is no signs of uh, hydrogen evolution. So with this electrolyte, we're able to cycle this full cell um, about 500, uh, 300 cycle with about 80% capacity retention uh, at one C rate. So we also want to compare the water stability window uh, of our electrolyte with other type of highly concentrated electrolytes. And we do that in a identical electrodes just for the parallel comparison. So you can see uh, molecular crowding electrolyte in fact provide a wider uh, stability window compared to the highly concentrated electrolyte. Um, to further support its efficacy for uh, so stabilizing water. Also, some of the uh, electrolyte that may give you wide voltage window, but in fact, in the real battery operation, you may still see hydrogen evolution. So we uh, par parallelly compare uh, the P uh, PEG molecular crowding electrolyte label in red and compare with uh, highly concentrated electrolyte you can see that we can still see some of the hydrogen evolution uh, in some of the electrolytes using highly concentrated electrolytes. So uh, these are the deep, small side reactions that we need to further uh, reduce 
but using molecular crowding, uh, it seems to be quite stable uh, in terms of suppressing HER. So what we compare so far is based on a pure electrolyte system with other highly concentrated electrolyte. But we also uh, know that there are other strategy uh, that has been developed in a, a water and salt uh, type of electrolyte such as gel coating. So we also apply the, the coating that developed by Professor Wang and Professor Shi, uh, a fluorinated coating to enable a four volt uh, full cell using the PEG molecular crowding electrolyte. So therefore, um, this is just a starting point for a pure electrolyte system that we can even add other type of strategy to make it uh, better. So, and the flammability test uh, also showed that the PG electrolyte um, can successfully put up the fire and would be stable uh, than the commercial electrolyte. But also the PEG molecular crowding electrolyte is also more stable than the PEG itself and even some of the polymers such as PEO. So uh, we believe that the water uh, play a critical role in the safety. So, so far the PEG molecular crowding electrolyte has been effective in providing wide voltage window uh, with low concentration of salt. However, its ionic conductivity is not uh, satisfactory. Um, it's ar around 0.8 millisiemen per centimeter, which is much lower than the 21 molarity of lithium TFSI in water. So, and why is that? So if you look at um, the viscosity of uh, PEG is significantly higher than the pure electrolyte. Um, therefore, we are developing a new type of crowding agent uh, with significantly lower viscosity uh, to improve this uh, ionic conductivity to more than two millisiemen per centimeter. And so that will help us to improve um, the electrolyte uh, conductivity and also the contact resistance of the cell. So here you can see that uh, with the new P, uh, it was a new crowding agent in blue. Uh, we can significantly reduce the over potential um, that in the cell compared to the PEG molecular crowding electrolyte. And using the uh, spectroscopy, we can also show that there is no sign of hydrogen evolution or oxygen evolution in this new type of uh, crowding agent electrolyte. So to, uh, to summarize this part, we believe that this is a new platform for designing high voltage aqueous electrolyte uh, using molecular crowding agents to break hydrogen bond network within the waters. Therefore, we can strengthen the OH stretching within the water molecule, therefore to widen the voltage window and stabilize the water. Um, Going beyond lithium ion batteries, uh, we actually learned uh, from previous uh, symposium lecture that if we want to uh, realize long duration energy storage, uh, we need to go beyond lithium ion battery. And low durations uh, is such as uh, more than 10 hours of storage and um, that we will need something else than a lithium ion battery. So in fact, Redox flow batteries uh, has a very good cost advantage for long duration application. So this is a schematic taken from a recent ITIF report, uh, very nicely schematically show uh, for a lithium ion battery, two times durations means two times cost for a particular application. But for redox flow battery, a two times duration will just need a small added cost on top of the original system. Thanks to its decouple power and energy and scalable durations. Um, also, an important feature of flow battery is that it has much lower safety hazard um, because we actually separated the positive and negative electrolyte. So they will not. Uh, 
be short circuiting or self discharge easily uh, if we stop the pumping. So therefore, there are a lot more uh, control over uh, lithium ion battery. However, flow batteries currently uh, are still struggling with a lot of challenges, including it's still expensive for short duration applications. Um, it has lower energy density and it suffer um, from crossover, which then become a problem for cycle life of the redox flow battery. So in our group, uh, to address this issue, we're looking at a very low cost uh, earth abundant element, sulfur. So polysulfide based redox flow battery um, is very safe and cheap thanks to uh, sulfur, which is we know extremely low cost and with high capacity. So you can see the cost per charge is significantly lower than that of vanadium that used in a vanadium redox flow battery. So using a polysulfide, in fact, is a great option. Um, so in the market, they are, they are polysulfide uh, bromide uh, flow battery, uh, but bromide could be a toxic uh, uh, gas uh, when during the cycling. So in 2016, we demonstrated using iodide uh, as a couple with polysulfide. Um, and this system, in fact, uh, achieved a lower chemical cost compared to the vanadium flow battery and promised higher uh, energy density compared to the vanadium flow battery. Um, when we did this uh, in 2016, unfortunately, we were using a commercial Nafion membrane, uh, and we always observe decay starts at about 50 cycles. And this decay is directly related to a few reasons. First is the crossover of polysulfide and polyiodide across the membrane. And this will lead to capacity loss. Um, and these capacity loss are essentially irrecoverable. And second is water migrations uh, and also OH migrations uh, through the membrane due to the osmosis pressure. And so this become a critical issues if you want to pursue polysulfide based redox flow battery. So recently we developed a new membrane um, and to help uh, mitigate these type of questions. So we uh, developed a PVDF bounded catch and black coating and to put on the both sides of the membrane. Um, and this membrane with a hydrophobic component of the PVDF, which can penetrate into the pores. And this can mitigate water and OH migration. Um, and this carbon phase could be absorbing the polysulfide on the negative side and absorbing uh, polyiodide on the positive side, which then can further repel its identical ions from further crossing over to the other side. So using this strategy, um, we hope to alleviate this crossover issue in the polysulfide redox flow battery. So to show its efficacy, we first to check the self discharge. So we charge the battery to a full uh, charge state and discharge and then let it uh, sit uh, without charging or discharge and measure the OCV. So you can see using the commercial membranes, the self discharge is very quickly and the battery basically go from full charge to almost zero volts over a cross of 50 hours. But using the modified membranes, uh, essentially we can, uh, it can last for more than 900 hours um, with very small decay over the course of 900 hours. And if you do the cycling of charge discharge, you can also see that the profile of the cell using this membrane are very consistent over cycles, uh, over 1200 cycles. But the one uh, with just nafion, you can see start to decay even at the 50 cycle. 
So we first uh, performed this static cell test to see the uh, membrane efficacy. So you can see that this type of membrane can reach more than 99.9 .9 columbia efficiency for polysulfide, uh, which is significantly higher than one piece of napia or even two pieces of napia. Um, and over the over three months, uh, it does not show any decay. And at the end, we start to see decays after three months. And you can actually calculate the final uh, decay rate is about 0.005% uh, per day or 0.0004% per cycle. So you can see this is completely different from what polysulfide would have been uh, in the commercial membrane. And then we start uh, using a fully flow, uh, two-sided fully flow uh, polysulfide iodide battery. And then we can see over the course of flow cycling, we still see a very stable uh, performance uh, over, again, 3.1 months. And at the end, we use a 100% SOC to check the actual remaining capacity. And we get more than 99.2% uh, remaining capacity after three months. So the decay rate for the flow battery is about 0.008% per day, which is quite similar to that of the static mode. Uh, which show that they are quite consistent, uh, stable without whether it's flow or not. So we want to understand what makes it so different between this membrane and the commercial membrane. So we uh, perform the uh, small angle x-ray diffraction to detect or to measure the water cluster size within the two different membrane. So you can see uh, the modified membrane has a much smaller water cluster size compared to that of the commercial membrane, which is consistent with a much lower water uptake of our modified membrane, as well as the much lower swelling ratio um, of the modified membrane. So that is the key to the restrained water migration, as well as the polysulfide crossover. We also perform an in-situ FTIR, try to understand the water migration behavior through the membranes. So what we did is we uh, perform a hydration and dehydration process and try to measure the water content in the membrane through the time. So you can see uh, with the commercial membrane, the water can go in and out through dehydration and absorption very quickly, but that of the modified membrane has much restrained water migration and water mobility. So that is also consistent with the stable cycling. So lastly, uh, we want to know what is the economical analysis for this type of uh, battery. So we adapt uh, a model from Schmidt and co-worker to calculate the levelized cost of storage. Um, as you can see from here, uh, the polysulfide iodide that we use our benchtop uh, lab scale prototype, you can see that it can be uh, much lower uh, in price compared to other emerging uh, flow battery, and even can be uh, beat the uh, well-established vanadium flow battery when the storage hour are more than 14 hours. So this is really targeting for long duration um, application. So to show that this is not only just the projection, we actually did a validation test for the flow cycle, uh, for the flow cell uh, of a storage time for 13 hours and 15 hours, and to see whether they can really hold up to this uh, long duration. So you can see uh, over 80 days, there there's no capacity decay that can be detected uh, using this membrane for the polysulfide iodide redox flow battery. So uh, to summarize, uh, today we discuss a new platform for designing high voltage aqueous sludge light using molecular crowding agents. Um, and this is a way that we can really expand uh, beyond lithium ion could go to uh, sodium and uh, potassium ion batteries uh, where 
molecular crowding agent could be low cost and environmental friendly to improve the stability of water. And second, we show that the membrane design is a deterministic factor um, of a polysulfide, low cost polysulfide flow battery. Um, and lastly, uh, for the audience uh, who is interested in assessment method and performance metrics for redox flow battery, uh, you're welcome to also check out our recent perspective in discussing the redox flow battery assessment methods and performance matrix in direct relationship to the working principles and the degradation mechanism. So this really um, help us to put things together um, and also have unified uh, performance matrix comparison uh, for the community. Uh, lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Hong Kong government for the funding agents, uh, RGC and the ITC. Uh, and the work presented today are mainly conducted by two of my students, uh, Ms. Jingxie and Dr. Zhe Junli. So, um, and thank you all for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Well, Yi Chun, thank you for the very nice talk and uh, very nice work. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, start by asking you first question. Um, if I look at Chunsen's work and your work about the, uh, you talk about this uh, concept of uh, molecular crowding. Uh, it's very, very interesting. Um, so this really made me uh, just recall uh, about maybe more than 10 years ago, about 2009, when Bob Huggins was still here working with me closely at Stanford. We started a, a piece of work. Uh, it's actually just increased concentration of electrolyte for the lithium system. So the overall idea of uh, whether it's uh, water and salt or molecular crowding is using something to hide up the water's activity, reduce water activity, so you can increase the stability window. I remember 2009, we, we see go up to like four molar, five molar concentration of lithium electrolyte. They, the stability window already increased, but we, that, we didn't go to the level of um, like what you and Chen Sun have been showing. So what I want, to, what I mean right here, this tied, uh, tied up the water activity is uh, critical to expand the stability window. Um, but at the same time, uh, you see ionic conductivity actually drops uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, aqueous solution, typically you are looking into it's like 100 millisiemens per centimeter square, that type of range, right? Uh, once this water gets tied up, uh, the ionic conductivity also drops down to single digit of millisiemens, maybe around that range. So what, what would be the balance in thinking about that? You know, what do we need uh, in ionic conductivity? And this all balance with water activity reduction. So I want to see your, your thoughts on, on this question. Yes, absolutely. This is one of the most important balance uh, in, in, this, in this line of research. So, um, so first of all, I think uh, ionic conductivity is very important. I think we need to at least get to uh, Five to ten or even twenty millisiemens centimeter uh, to be to be more competitive uh, and I guess practical. Uh, so I guess uh, right now uh, using the PEG molecular crowding electrolyte, it was below one millisiemens. So the, the approach we are using right now is to reduce the viscosity of the polymer itself. So finding those polymers that uh, even much lower viscosity. And in, in our recent experiment, it shows that you can increase about to about three to five millisiemens. Um, and that is one direction is, is for whatever tidying up the water molecule, we want to make sure that is not very viscosity, very high viscous. So that's one thing. Um, and also, I guess salt is always a, a the, the reason for higher conductivity, right? So maybe now we are only used to molarity, maybe slightly increased, but just to increase the ionic conductivity. Um, there are other uh, school of thoughts that uh, in, the, in the research paper that uh, people may be adding organic electrolyte that has lower viscosity 
uh, to the water and salt type of electrolyte to increase the conductivity. But also that's as a disadvantage of safety, right? So, mm -hmm. so we are looking at safety, uh, conductivity, and the voltage window. So in my opinion, I think since we are working on this for the safety, so I think the, the safety is first, right? Otherwise we just use non-aqueous electrolyte. Uh, so with that, uh, the voltage window, we want to go through maybe, right now we are looking at 3.2 to four volts. So uh, now we can enable LTO, but can we enable graphite? Right? So if aqueous type of electrolyte can enable graphite, then that would be also very good. Um, I think ionic conductivity for practical, maybe around five millisiemen could be already practical, but of, of course, better, the higher, the better. But again, we are looking at the, the balance here. So it's, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, second question. Um, so these uh, uh, clouded, uh, uh, molecular clouding electrolyte, uh, you look at the HER side, it's suppressed. Uh, so OER, do you want to comment on OER side? This is also a question from an audience. Uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what's the suppression uh, effect on, on the OER? Uh, yes. do, you get even, do you get more suppression or do, why do you get so little suppression if uh, right. very little, yeah. yeah. Yes. Actually, this is a very critical question. Uh, in, the, in the beginning, when I discussed this idea with uh, Professor uh, Kanshi, uh, he also actually pointed out uh, from our data that it's a very asymmetry suppression. So we suppress a lot of HER, but OER is actually pretty similar to every other type of electrolyte. Uh, and we actually kind of figure out a little bit why. Um, so the reason we improve HER is because we strengthen the OH bonding of the, of the water. But if you look at OER process, the rate determining step of OER is actually not OH bond breaking, but the rate determining step for HER is the OH bond breaking. But the rate determining step for OER is more like the, say the uh, O. Uh, OH desorption or the O desorption to form oxygen. So because they have different rate determining step, this molecular crowding method can affect HER a lot, but not much of the OER. So in order to do that, then you need to look at the rate determining step for OER. So it's really the desorption uh, or the adsorption of the water, then I think modifying electrode surface would be more effective for the OER. Um, so that's also something we are uh, go doing right now is try to see different type of electrode modification to, to see how much we can suppress the OER side. Yeah, so this is great. Um, so the next question uh, related to your redox flow, I mean, very nice work you exploring uh, uh, polysulfide chemistry as NO iodine as a uh, cathode. I mean, we know in the redox flow battery is always you want to come up the right pairing, having the right potential, right solubility and, and so on. So uh, first question is, is iodine considered uh, attractive? Uh, I see your cost analysis, right? Go down to about $80 per kilowatt hour materials cost. Is, is that limited by iodine? I, yes. That's my assumption also, yeah. Yes, um, yes. So, so it would be great to come on another redox cover. <laughs> that's much lower cost. That's one question I want to pick your thought. The second question is this iodine side and the uh, polysulfide side, right? I think this audience is also a person asking the question, great question. Looks like it's a pH mismatch, right? It, it, is my understanding correct? They are a different pH condition. Yeah, right. it, would that cause a quite big of problem to handle, you know, uh, during the operation. Yes, so, so let me start with the second question. So yes, the, the pH is quite slightly different. So one is a neutral uh, and one is uh, more on the alkaline side. So therefore the OH migrations and water migration associated with the OH migration is very critical. Therefore, 
without membrane modification, you can see we can't do more than 50 cycles. So that is why the membrane is so important. When you have the membrane modification, you can do it right. Um, but the first question, iodine is definitely the cost limitation uh, we're looking at here. Um, and I mean, there are, there are op options uh, with lower cost, like a bromine, right? So polysulfide bromide is actually a commercial, uh, almost commercial uh, system that's available in, the, in, the, in a lot of star company. Uh, so I think this membrane can also be applied in the polysulfide bromide system. It's just that we didn't do the bromide because we don't want to deal with the toxic gas uh, and et cetera. So, but that doesn't prevent uh, this membrane applied in the lower cost of the bromide system. So you're absolutely right. I think the iodide, um, uh, it is the cost uh, limitation, but it is already better than vanadium. So. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that could be a uh, something that we should keep searching. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, that's great. Um, Yichun, uh next question is, um, well, there's a, a person in the audience asking, so the solvation, you know, uh, is the key you're playing right now. Uh, so what about coating on the electrode? I can you you kind of already mentioned that already. M maybe yes. giving you a little bit more time to expand on that. How does the coating on the electrode, in conjunction with with electrolyte, can improve uh, the uh, the performance, suppress the side chemical reaction even further? Just expand on that a little bit. The the, the effect of coating. Yes. So uh, this is a great question. So after we kind of not figure out, but have a hypothesis on why OER is not changing as much. So we immediately thought, okay, let's suppress its rate determining step. So first let's maybe have a hydrophobic coating on the, on the electrodes, especially on the positive side. Um, and so that can help to prevent water get closer to the electrodes. Um, and, and that also applies to say we can have hydrophobic coating on the carbon particles. Uh, so that's actually something we are working on right now to in conjunction with the molecular crowding and the electrodes modification to see if that can bring both OER and HER together. So uh, I think hydrophobic coating is one path. Um, also, it could be a oxide, a lithium ion conducting oxide uh, that is not electrical conductive, but ele ionic conductive, right? So these two paths could uh, could really help on OER side, uh, in my opinion. So yeah. So maybe one last question, then we'll bring uh, both uh, Will and Chen Sun back to the panel discussion. Um, the uh, redox flow you show the iodine and the uh, polysulfide with this uh, incredible performance, uh, this new paper you have uh, uh, this year in <laughs> Nature Energy. Um, so in the redox flow, we all know, um, you know, one major issue, uh, right, is a crossover uh, between redox species. Once, you know, it cross over, even you uh, cross over just 1%, and over the cycle, this will degrade fast because of mixing now the species. Um, for most redox couple, they are not allowed to mix, except very few redox uh, systems that, 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 that could be fine. Kind of people like mixture of iron chromium, you know, different concentration. So I don't need to go, go into the detail. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, looking in your uh, data, uh, have you done the measurement just after cycling this flow, this liquid in and out for number cycle, measuring using maybe ICP, right? Elemental analysis on different analyte or cathode light, and that will give you the quantified concentration of crossover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, would you be able to see the true crossover rates uh, like 0.1% per cycle or, or, or less? You know, I, right. I want right. to see on this yeah yeah that, that's an excellent point um but so yes i think that would be a uh, important maybe very much more quantitative way uh just kind of do the icp on both sides of electrolyte we haven't done that 
Um, and so I think that's something we, we were definitely uh, looking to do that. And, but basically through the uh, estimation from the capacity loss over the course of say three or four months, that's what we are currently using. But uh, I, I agree with you, I think uh, uh, to go to that, even just 1% or 0.1% 0 .1 over cycles, it will be a lot. So. Uh, that's something we were definitely looking to. Yeah, great. Yichun, thank you so much for your thank great you. talk. Um, and let me bring Will and Chunsen back to the stage as well. We can have a little bit of discussion. Maybe Will, I just throw uh, out one question for both of them, then you, you, you can ask your, your question. So, so Chunsen, I enjoy your, uh, at the beginning, the two slide overview, kind of generation by generation of, uh, uh, electrolyte design you know <laughs> you know my talk i like to use gen generation that's uh, indicate as the understanding progression so you are showing that slide very nicely um this uh idea of using high concentration eventually get to you know water and salt or solvent and salt type of concept there's a local diluent uh, you you are doing jason Zhang is doing uh and piano now right um this all this idea coming in, you know, um, so it looks like you are changing. Number one is uh, also in each one's talk, the solvation structure, uh, quite a bit, the solvation structure. You tied up the solvent molecule, so you enhance uh, the decomposition of um, the anion together with your lithium, building that sta stable interface. Uh, with all this idea coming in, what will be your, you know, favorite idea for both of you to say that's the path I can go down to because this parameter space is so big, you need to consider A, B, C, D, E in order to have ideal electrolyte. So what really give you the very exciting path to go down to you say, I can have all these parameters within a range I could tune to become practical electrolyte. So, Right now, because this is really uh, a balance of different parameters. So we want to get in our organic reads ICI or CI. In that case, for ICI, we have to reduce the solvation, solvent reduction potential. If you reduce selected uh, solvent has a lower reduction potential, and then the high voltage you have an issue. And so that's the reason when you go to the some case and then you have to make a decision. Solvent really, really uh, impact, have a big impact for SCI or CI. So that's the reason two years ago, we think we should go to the ionic liquid. That one, we do not have a solvent, but ionic liquid right now still cost is high. Another option is use inorganic the, the utilic, the salt. So that case, we also do not have solvent. And only some utilic, their own, their melting point is 50. So we can go to the 80. We demonstrate some, some uh, really good performance. And another case is solid state. They also no solvent. But that case, you, we need to consider how can we form, form lithium fluoride, ICI, uh, lithium chloride, which has high interface energy with the either silicon or the lithium metal. If you, you have to use solvent, and then we need to consider balance the, the voltage and also can ionic conductivity. So the trick is right now, we think the direction maybe need to go is the solvent has a lower like uh, the, the bonding with the lithium, but they still have a reasonable solubility. And they also have a high, like the anotic stability. This kind of, at the beginning, you think it's con the, the contradicted with a different performance, but uh, the, recently, it really has kind of this kind of solvent. Like uh, the Zhang Qiang in the Tsinghua University, he published one paper. Uh, they have a solvent dielectric, the number is really small, but they still have a solubility. Meaning is the solvent bonded with the lithium 
uh, is really weak, but it still have a reasonable uh, ionic conductivity. Then we still have a conductivity and also they are not reduced. So this, we need to have a new criteria. What, what is the limit critical parameter control the solubility, also the reduction potential? The salvation energy is weak, but they still have a solubility. Mm -hmm. So this the, the region is only a few papers. Uh, that is the reason in my group, we signed student, we tried this the, the, the direction. See, overall comprehensively, what is the, the parameter really can control? You still have a high solubility, reasonable high solubility, but the solvation energy is very small. And so they can, when little more solvent is not more, but the, the little is really carry the ion to the ion side. So this is a little bit complicated, but they still have a room to go there. Yeah, each other. Yes, so uh, for us, uh, the first criteria we think is whether we can put this into market. Uh, so it has to be low cost and it has to be eco-friendly. So that's why we, we pursue the molecular crowding with the polymer. Uh, so, but then now we are limited by ionic conductivity and we are still want to further expand the voltage from LTO to potentially graphite. So um, I think there are a few parameters we are looking at. So the viscosity of the polymer, and we also want to increase the water content. So right now it's below 10%. So we want to increase the water content to 20 or even 30%. At the same time, that basically guarantee the safety, but also increase the conductivity. But then the key is whether we can also expand the voltage. And so I think the molecular crowding agent, the ability to lock down the water is something we are looking into. So we believe, um, I mean, we don't have to go to super high conductivity. So it's something that's practical, but we guarantee safety. Then I think there will be a space for this type of uh, system uh, in the market. So that's something we are, uh, exploring right now. And of course, including the electro modification in conjunction with the electrolyte uh, modification. So uh, we are very excited about this. And I think so there's a lot could be done. Um, and uh, there's something we are uh, working on uh, in, in tuning different parameters that we, uh, including viscosity, uh, voltage window. And the voltage window actually relates to the crowding ability through the agent and then also water content we want to go up and that will help us to achieve the target uh, yeah so that's our yeah our approach <laughs> yeah maybe i add up one additional point for the <clears throat> high concentrated electrolysis you see the ionic conductivity is lower but they normally increase the transfer number so they, if you increase transfer number, overall, the conduction is not too bad. So it really depend on how can you the, the balance the, the total, we say total conduction, not only use the conductivity to be better. If a transfer number really increase a lot, they still can balance some reduced ionic conductivity. Thanks. Well, uh, thank you. E. So, Trenzhen and Yijun, I found a very strong link in your presentation today is that both of you are guided by chemical intuition and also chemical design rules, which I think is very exciting, much better than just trying a bunch of things. I have noticed in both of your work, you are focused on sort of one or two major descriptor that governs your design for electrolytes, uh, for flow battery chemistry. I'm a little bit curious because I think from a design perspective, having more knobs is even more powerful, right? To vary more things, but it, of course, as he says, makes it more complicated. So I'm wondering if you can expand beyond the descriptors you have talked about, for example, and Trenton, in your work, you talk about the reduction potential. You know, are there other sort of 
up and rising descriptors that you are considering that could be interesting knobs that uh, the community should be thinking about to give some additional freedoms to tune the chemistry. This is a little bit too big. So, but I want to say, based on my thinking, I really think right now, really mature battery is graphite lithium cobalt side. Right now, everybody want to move high energy. So you have to increase the lithium cobalt side capacity, use MC. And graphite, you have to use the silicon and then the lithium metal. So right now, the, 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 right now we use the mature experience and to design high capacity cathode and anode. And looks like based on my experience, we cannot just copy improve. And because in, when the volume change largely, you have to think in a uh, different. So right now we have a, a big gap at the graphite we already identified, but the lithium metal and the silicon, we just have a limited experience. Is there any really continuous guideline? We say, when volume change from 12% graphite to silicon 300% to lithium infinitive. And when volume change, how it linked with interface energy the bonding, how it linked with LCA mechanical property. If we have a continuous this kind of model, and then we can systematically design it. And also the cathode, the same thing. Cathode we need to consider also Right now, everybody is modified coating the surface. That is really uh, input the performance, but that kind of capability I see I cannot have heating. Many, many cycles, they will lost the capability. And a lot of people, they crack and they think that they heal the crack. But if the same principle, if can self form the CI bit more fluoride, they definitely can block the electrolyte penetration, then they are super fine. The same principle. And what is the volume change and interface and bonding between the CA to the to the, the cattle? That also critical for the next generation of lithium ion battery. So we if we have a general design principle, not just pick up chemistry, one chemistry, another one, and then we help the whole community have an overall knowledge for next generation battery, what is the design principle? If we know the SCF design principle, and then we go for the design electrolytics. So if that happens, then that will help the community not just try. And even some principle is not perfect. When you modify, do experiment, you can further refine the principle. So principle may be more help. So that is my Chen Sun, I agree with you. I think this uh, new material adding a very important dimension is this uh, materials uh, <clears throat> change, volume change, breathing. So coupled together with SEI and CEI, that dimension is uh, made things so complicated. That how yeah. do that require new thinking? Yeah, I just want to resonate with what you just said. Yeah. Um, so, so Will, you mentioned about what other knobs that we can tune. I think uh, what I'm looking at is how can we improve the safety of the electrolyte, right? So water is one route. And so when we go to the water route, then you have to find all different ways to stabilize water, right? So then you can go into a water install, more crowding, and, and so on. But there's another route uh, to improve the safety is the fire reductant agents, right? So you can put into um, things that you can put up the fire and or even not never go into fire. But those small molecules can also have negative impact on the cycling stability. So stabilizing water or stabilizing the fire redundant uh, uh, agent is two things that we all want safety. And that's, I think, I mean, uh, like Professor Trey's work uh, on the, the current collector, you can actually uh, encapsulate the, uh, the fire redundant agent and release at the, uh, at the time where it needed, right? So I think there's a lot of space uh, uh, and design rules that we can targeting a good safety 
it doesn't have to go to the water route. I think um, there are uh, a lot of different uh, parameters we can tune, not just electrolyte, but also current collector structures, uh, the membranes, right? So I think uh, to, to improve and achieve safety, I think that uh, we'll, we will need a lot of options and, um, and, and, and together with electrolyte, electrodes, and separator to make it a, a safer options for our future battery application. So that's my, my belief that we need to encourage um, different type of thinking and uh, approach to, to achieve that uh, as a community together. Well, it's a very rich playground for sure. E, back to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Will. Uh, let me ask you, just brainstorming with you guys, right? I want to see your thought on uh, this question. Will and I have been talking about this a lot. You know, in the past, a storage X symposium, this discussion topic on long duration storage, each and you, you know, one of your, you know, pro, your paper today, you talk about that. Now, can we really look for the battery system that can get us to the cost, right? And, talking about in the order of $10 per kilowatt hour. I'm talking about roughly about orders of magnitude, lower than lithium iron. Um, what's the possibility right there? <laughs> so I think lithium iron will go down to the past in the cell level cost, you're going to see $80, $60 per kilowatt hour, probably in the next five years also in the cell level, right? And then below 50, then, uh, lithium ion probably very, very challenging. And then we need to think about completely different chemistry. $10 per kilowatt <laughs> hour. Right, let, let's, how, how do we do that? What, what's, what's the thinking uh, about that? Is it an aqueous system or is it you know, <laughs> still organic system? What's the you know, endo chemistry, cathode chemistry that's possible to get us there? Uh, otherwise, we cannot have this weekly, right, monthly energy storage. If we haven't talked about seasonal yet, I mean, seasonal, maybe even $10 per kilowatt hour is not sufficient. So let's brainstorm on this topic a little bit. We'll certainly feel free to chime in as well. I think this is panel discussion. We can all chime in. So my personal thinking, if we really reduce the cost, one is you have to increase energy density and also material cheap. That is a foundation. If we, you can do not have this tool, then the chance is low. And then energy density. And then we consider you have to use the air. In that case, it means we not carry the, the oxygen. So that is a metal air. But metal air, if you consider lithium organic, that is really hard. And then we narrow it to the aqueous. Aqueous, and then aqueous stable, also cheap, maybe zinc. So I'm thinking maybe zinc air battery, if you really can make designed aqueous electrolysis, they can tolerate like carbon dioxide and they, they, can, they will not evaporate because that one high concentration can do it, but a high concentration the increase cost. But we need to find something they can stabilize the water, not evaporate, and so they cannot. They will not react with carbon dioxide and zinc. They form SEI, and they will not have a dendrite. All this combined together maybe has opportunity. And if you really seal, use organic even you use really, really uh, cheap material. And normally cheap material, they have an uh, energy density is low. So like we use a lithium bromide, a lithium chloride, that one may be cheaper. And, but you have to match with uh, lithium metal if you use graphite, it still cannot be really high energy density. So, um, so two point one is current organic one, you have to develop a cattle because anode silicon maybe work, but cathode is really limited. If we cannot find the breakthrough on the cathode, really high energy density, and that is really hard. Also, this should be cobalt, nickel free. So that is one direction, but that is improvement. It's not 
you cannot expect a suddenly change. But uh, chemistry is in here maybe has an opportunity, but they still have a lot of challenges. And um, but uh, at least this open system maybe has an opportunity uh, to do that. Solid state air is still a lot of challenges there. So we don't know that is, but it's still an option. But the cost of manufacturing are also a challenge. So that is also my personal opinion. <laughs> That's a good thought, Jensen. Uh, Yi Chun. <clears throat> so yeah, I think well, ten dollar per kilowatt hour. So <laughs> I don't know if that's possible, but I think if any any chemist is gonna make it, um, well, I think uh, Professor Donald Sutherway once said that if you want to make electric the storage dirt cheap, you want to make them dirt, right? So um, I think sulfur is already very cheap. And um, so there's so, you know, irons. So, I mean, in the redox flow uh, chemistry, you can involve uh, iron. Iron could be, some of the iron could be at a higher positive size. So iron and sulfur. And I think flow battery has really good advantage in long duration. If you're talking about 24 hours, 24 days or seasonal, the costs basically go down to just chemical costs. So the, the membrane, the stack will become very negligible. So um, I think if we want to target $10 per kilowatt hour, I think redox flow battery, long durations, um, sulfur and irons will be something that we, we and because the chemical cost is, is, is basically right there. You have to, um, you cannot ignore them. So, that's something I would, uh, and of course, an aqueous system. So that's something um, would be maybe a possibility one day. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thought. Iron and sulfur. The voltage is probably about one point two, one point three volt, right? Because iron two yeah. plus three plus is what three point four versus lithium. Sulfur is about two, two point one. So okay, sounds reasonable. <laughs> Uh, well, do you want to chime in? <laughs> sure, maybe, maybe given that we are at the end of the hour, maybe I will have the final word today. This is a great discussion and this is a, you know, a really tough question. So I will just share <laughs> some of my, my learnings and East job, of course, is to ask the, the hard question. You know, if we look at the benchmark, right? What is a good benchmark? Let's look at in the lithium ion battery area, lithium ion phosphate and graphite, right? Both of this material, the cost is dominated by shipping. The raw material is nearly free, right? Lithium iron phosphate now is close to $5 a kilogram and will only become lower. And if you can produce them locally, use them locally, it's, it will be even less expensive. So that's the benchmark, right? But when you put this into the whole battery, the architecture determines the cost, not the material, nor the chemistry. So I can already sort of imagine the future in which for lithium ion battery, the chemistry is free. Then it's all about the manufacturing, about the architecture. So that's why I'm you know, really thinking that if we can put substantial resources into new architecture, like the new architecture for metal air, new act architecture for flow battery, and really think about the cost of making the cell. So I think this is my sort of realization lately that at least for lithium ion battery, the chemistry is already nearly free if we are willing to accept, say, the performance uh, attributes of lithium ion phosphate and graphite. And, and that is pretty good for grid level storage already. So I think my two cents is it really comes on the cell and architecture and upscaling. And that's going to be a very hard problem. Just look at how much money has gone into lithium ion battery. So if we can put the same investment in the new architectures, I think there's great hope and great future. Hopefully some of our colleagues from government and industry are uh, paying attention. I think here is where massive investment will result in massive breakthrough. So hopefully that could be an inspiration as well for all the great work that both of you presented today. But uh, before we close, uh, Chen Shen and, and, and Yichun, do you want to have any final uh, advice for maybe the younger students and postdocs who are listening uh, in what they should be thinking to do in the future to contribute to solving these problems? Okay, so when I talk to my students, um, I, I always encourage them thinking differently. And because 
you right now so many people work on uh, lead mobile and if you just follow improvement and then that is a slow process even if we think differently even we are not successful but if one time successful we really make a big change so i really encourage the student do some uh, thinking differently and thinking big don't afraid the fail because we expect from the fail you learn and uh, next time in a five or six year period in the PAD, you maybe have a chance to successful. So that is always can move the technology forward. So that is my expectation. Yeah, I fully agree with Professor Wong. And I, I think one thing I talk to my students when they try to evaluate if something is worthwhile doing, I always ask, well, what if let you let assume you 100% achieve what you want to do in your proposal. And, and then you ask a question, can you change the world even without, even with 100% successful of, uh, of doing you, what you are proposing? And if you can't, then don't do it because we may <laughs> not do 100%, but if you do 80%, 60%, so not, not even a chance, right? So that's dream big and also kind of like resonant with Professor Trey mentioned, like what well, think out of the box and just challenge $10 per kilowatt hours. Why not? What limits us? And so I think we always are limited by ourselves and thinking big uh, is something it's very important and not to be afraid uh, to be, to be uh, I guess, making value. But I think that is how we learn. So. Um, I think we, we, we all are learn from mistake and do not be afraid. And that's something has been very helpful to personally and also my group. So that's my, that's my thoughts. Fantastic. Will, you have the final word. To <laughs> this, is, this is so inspiring. I, I need to uh, reflect on your inspirational words and maybe copy them as well. Uh, <laughs> thank you both very much. Um, I think this is the first time we have a truly international symposium uh, with uh, Ijun from Hong Kong, and then Trinshen joining us from Maryland, of course, Ian and myself in California. So we have exactly 12 hour time difference, I think. So <laughs> Ijun, very, uh, we're very thankful uh, for you staying up until midnight in Hong Kong to join us. But I think this has been a very, uh, international and global discussion in the literal sense. So thank you both very much for doing this. So I just want to remind everyone that we have four more symposium for our spring quarter um, storage X events. Next, in two weeks, we have a, a very exciting session featuring uh, Tim Holm, who is the co-founder of QuantumScape, and Professor Jennifer Roop from MIT, who will talk about solid state batteries. After that, we have uh, Diane Gurnich, who is the former California Utility, uh, utility Public Commissioner, uh, who will talk about building energy efficiency and energy storage. Um, in June 4th, we will have the head of batteries at Volkswagen, uh, Frank Blom, talk about their recent progress. And then to close the quarter off, we'll be joined by Professor Yang Kuk Sang from Hanyang University and Professor Huber Gastiager from the University of Munich to talk about latest progress in cathodes. So please mark your calendars. These all will be 7 a.m. Pacific. I also want to invite everyone uh, to be connected to us. We have a lot of exciting programs coming out. Um, if you are, are a LinkedIn user, um, please uh, consider joining our LinkedIn network. Um, you can also uh, participate in other talks. We have a, uh, two technical talks by our current students and postdocs on April 30th, uh, next week. And then finally, uh, for professionals joining us who are interested in learning more about the energy transition broadly, uh, Stanford offers uh, numerous online courses, uh, including uh, technologies for energy storage and many other things. And you can find this online um, on our website and also at online.stanford.edu. And with that, um, I would like to close the symposium today and thanks everyone for listening and have a great day and great evening thank you okay thank you
Thank you. Thank bye you very bye. much. Bye Thank bye. you, Fun. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.